Fulfillment of what the sages say. If you, the people of Israel, accept my Torah, which was the Decalogue, for the Ten Commandments and others, if you'll accept it, well and good. And if you won't, the whole world will go back to Tohu Bahohu, to chaos. So we're seeing this happening today. The last week was unbelievable. Germany, which for all these decades has been the country that felt that Mein Kampf, Hitler, should be obliterated. They did not permit the publication of Mein Kampf. In last weeks, they supported it, republished it. At the same time, they brought in a million Muslims, mainly refugees, many of them Clearly, those who have been reared on the importance of destroying all the Jews. And then they went and made, founded by the United Nations, an international day to celebrate the day when Auschwitz was freed by the Russians, this should be the international commemoration of the Holocaust. At the same time, Europe, including Germany, 40% anti-Semites is the present statistics. This is without reckoning how many anti-Semites have been absorbed by Europe through being classed as refugees. What a hypocrisy. Unfortunately, neo-Nazism is growing and certainly the Muslim threats are growing in Europe and all over the world. And who is blamed by many of them for the Muslim threats? With the lies, that's how Hitler started, with all his lies. And that's how he managed to arm Deutschland über alles and to exterminate not just six million Jews, millions of other innocent people. And what does Hitler say in his Mein Kampf, which is now being published far and wide and has been adopted by Islam, more extreme elements? that the Jews, every Jew is to be obliterated. Why? These are his words. I quote his words, both from Mein Kampf as well as from conversations that he had, famous conversations, where he said, the Jews are to be exterminated, 
because they weaken the mind of man with a conscience and all conscience all talk about ethics and morality and the Ten Commandments has no relevance anymore. It has weakened the mind of man and it also weakened the concept, the strength of man through their uh, circumcision ritual. It's just unbelievable that this is what is mentioned in the Chumash in connection with Amalek. The Amalek also, Lo Yare Elohim. Their principle was, we do not believe Yerat Elohim for non-Jews. Throughout the Bible, God-fearing means people who have basic minimum morality. That the first time we find this mentioned by Avram Avino when he went to Egypt, he said, you know, I've got a beautiful wife and uh, Maraguni, they're going to kill me here because uh, she is extremely attractive because there's ain rak ein yirat ilokim ba makom hazeh, Maraguni al ishti. There's no yirat ilokim. Amalek is the one who when all the days of Shomu Amin Bir Gazun, Chila Chaz, the Palestinians of that time, the Canaanites, they were all frightened of the God of Israel. So Amalek attacked Israel because they wanted to destroy faith in the God of Israel. That's after the ten plagues. And if we go into it more deeply, the Decalogue, we don't call it Ten Commandments, but there are many more commandments, but still, the essence of the Decalogue, as it was given in the desert of Sinai, was that it was to be applied to all mankind. When mankind didn't accept it, the other nations didn't say we can't keep to it, we can't keep to the Noahide Code, which included in the, de in the, in the de Decalogue. So, they refused to accept it. It was given to the people of Israel. It was given to the people of Israel, as it says in the preamble to the Decalogue, that the purpose of this special revelation is to describe the importance of the people of Israel in their relationship to the nations of the world. Because the introductory mission statement is that, first of all, you, the people is, have got to keep my covenant for the purpose which translated and as, a, as it was applied throughout time, and as we see, has great application today, you, the people of Israel, will have to be the kingdom of priests. That means, I want you to become the nation that will be priestly to all mankind, and change them. You have to be Goy Kadosh, so therefore you've got to be a special people. It's a gula. Because the whole, I want all mankind to come to me. That was the original purpose of Abraham Avino, known as a teacher, the father of all mankind, through, through whom all the families of the earth will ultimately be blessed. How could that happen? It could only happen. It could have happened then if the nation the world would accept, will accept it also. But they rejected it, weren't ready. So it's not, it's not, unfortunately, they were still so much engulfed in idolatry. So therefore, you've got to be a holy nation, you've got to be in a bit of a higher level, to be a model for the other nations of the world, like the Kohanim afterwards became the model of divine service for the rest of the nation of Israel. 
So the nation of Israel as a whole should be a model for all the nations of the world. I want them all to come to me, as will ultimately happen. It will happen sooner or later. How many of the nations of the world will be able to participate in the ultimate dream of Hashem depends a great deal upon them, but all depends upon us. So the sages say, why is it called Sinai? We know it's called Sinai because of the thorny bush. The snare is really a bush which has thorns. And thorns prick and hurt. And they say it's called Sinai because from there came out Sinai, hatred against Hashem and against the people of Israel. And why is it called Choreb? Because it's a Khurban, it's a destruction. The greatness of the Decalogue is that it acts as something which ultimately will destroy the idolaters and remove them from this globe, but unfortunately it comes through the power of sinner. Instead of admiring us, they hate us. Instead of accepting this code as a basis for the survival of the human race, they go against it. And let's say the first, <coughs> first commandment, we know of the commandments, the first group, the five, between man and Hashem, second, between man and man. Anuchi Hashem Elokecha is a guarantee for thou shalt not murder. Because where is this written? It's explicit in the Bible, it says, it's implicit from the killing that took place in Cain and Heaven, and later the revelation of the Noahide Code, where it was told, Shofech dam ha'adam, ba'adam damu yishafech. After the deluge, to create a brave new world that should not end up in the deluge of fire. So Hashem said, anyone who spilled the blood of his fellow man, he has to be killed. Why? Because man was created in the image of God. Therefore, every human life is sacred. Doesn't mean to say, it says here itself, that the murderer himself should be left alive. No. So, if it's clear that he's a murderer and wants to continue, Kill him before he kills other people. That's already implicit in his first commandment for the Noahide Code. But what's it based on? Because human beings create the image of God. And what did Hitler like to, to destroy? He hated this. He rebelled against God and against the soul, against any aspect of humanity, humanism. And believed in the power of the sword, al And unfortunately, instead of mankind recognizing this and realizing that it's Israel and the Jewish people who are really on the highest level of valuing life. And what has the army even done and all other groups? They've even brought themselves to great sacrifices in order to avoid killing any innocents, non-stop. And on the contrary, they're always willing at any time to help to save lives throughout the globe. Instead of appreciating this, today we have the continuation of the perversion of truth in every aspect of the battle against the truth, the eternal truth of the Decalogue. 
So therefore, at this time, I feel it's essential for us to try to understand the relevance of what we call Decalogue, the Aseret Hadvarim, as they're called in the, in the, in the Chumash, or Aseret Hadibrot, which is the express, expression given by the sages, but not Asara Mitzvah, because even to fulfill the headings of the Aseret Adibrot, we as Jews, we see in the Aseret Adibrot a hint at all the mitzvot. Prasadjik <coughs> on one of the earliest great authorities, when he counted up all the 630 mitzvot, he categorized them under the heading of the Aseret Adibrot, the Ten Declarations. So in connection with this, If you have a look at the text of the Aserah Tadibrot, chapter 20, I first want to express something concerning the significance of the two Luchot. It's also meant for Hitler, these tablets of stone have no relevance. They had on them the ten sayings, it means nothing. And because of them, we have to destroy the Jewish people. Now, it is remarkable that until today, the Aserat Adibrat, which is called by the world the Ten Commandments, are a moralizing force amongst many human beings. And uh, the symbol is put up in many places. Those who are the righteous ones amongst the nations of the world. But their impact is not strong enough to destroy the most terrible cruelty and corruption that takes place in the world today. So there's a very, in connection with this concept, there's something which occurred to me, I haven't seen it in any of our traditional commentaries, but it occurred to me yesterday, if you look at the text, we know Anuchi Hashem Lokecha is the basis, took you out from the land of Egypt, where I demonstrated that I, Hashem, rule the world. Some say it's the first Dibur, some say it's really not a mitzvah, it's an introduction to mitzvah. Some say it's actually a mitzvah, we'll go into that later. And it's clear that is parallel by the first one of the second Luach, thou shalt not murder. Now the, dip, the Dipurim, the ten parts of the Decalogue, of the Aseret Advarim, they are mentioned in some of the verses. The first verse, distance of Hashem. The second verse, we should have no idols. Not of any other God, no idols. That's quite a few verses together. The third one is, we should not take the name of God in vain, neither in an oath, nor even to blaspheme him in any manner. The fourth one is the Shabbat, quite a few verses. The fifth one is honoring parents, which is the link between the first five and the second five. But the second five are very brief indeed. 
And the way in which it was read yesterday, if you would have taken notice, the first four are one verse. Comes out, if you look, although there's a mark of a separation of the text, but it's one verse. Verse 13. Verse 13 is Lot Sertzak, Lot Sinaf, Lot Tikkino. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not rob. You should not tell lies, you should not make false testimony in one verse. Then comes Lot Tachmod. You should not covet that which is not yours. So it's surprising that these four basic social crimes all in one verse. Why is this? Why is it all one verse? So we could explain it as follows. Hashem is telling us, He's telling the world to some extent, He's telling us the Jews. So we have this commandment to accept Hashem as our God, then the unity of God, we don't accept any others, we don't blaspheme. These are matters that we share with the Noachide Code. Then the next one, the Shabbat, especially for the people of Israel. And then comes honoring parents. And all these are elaborated. They all have the name of Hashem attached, Hashem Elohim is attached to them. So Hashem maybe is telling us, you as the Jewish people, if you will be filled with the awareness of Hashem in all areas of life, in your business and creative activity, in your family life, you'll bring the concept of the greatness of listening constantly to the voice of Hashem, recognize that He is the one who's given you guidance, then you won't be plagued with murders, with severe perversion in family life, in morality. You won't be faced with robberies nor with falsehood. It'll come automatic. You won't have to work on it. Why? Because if you become the awareness of Hashem, you'll be, to some extent, immunized. You'll be inhibited against all these things. On the whole, we must say that the religious community of the people of Israel have become inhibited. We don't feel we've got, well, got freedom to accept Hashem or not. But if we accept Him and bring Him into our lives, and we observe the Shabbat, we observe family life as it should be, then, of course we're not going to murder. And we're not going to go for perversions, and destroy family life. We're not going to rob others, nor are we going to give false testimony about any aspect. We want to keep the truth. But Lotachmod there, Lotachmod is separate because that is a commandment which cannot be given by human beings, it can only be given by Shem himself. And it's something to covet somebody else's that can only come about if you work on yourself that you, you take the awareness of Hashem to such an extent that it enters also into your natural desires, the desires of the Yitzhahara, because everyone is given tests. How far are you going to covet others, put yourself in front of others? How far are you going to contain and control your sexual drive? All these things need work. But maybe that's why it's in one sentence. Now from this, I want to go to, first of all, a, deep, a deeper concept. I've put here on the whiteboard, as you'll see, I've put an olive. Now, we know which is the beginning of the revelation of Hashem to the world. Where's the beginning? When he spoke to uh, Noah? <coughs> Where's the beginning of the Torah? Bereshit. Bereshit. 
begins with the bait. And the reset is the way in which Elohim, Elohim is the many phenomena of nature all come from one source, one creator. So we can say Bereshit describes the origin of the world. As I would say more as a present power, we say in the Tefillah, Mechadish B'chol Yom Tamid Ma'aseh Bereshit, it's a renewal. It's the awareness of Hashem which comes through recognizing nature. <coughs> and it says, the word Elohim is described by the prophet Ru Mi Vara Eile. Me and Eile. Me and Eile is the letters of the name Elohim transposed. Eile are all the phenomena that human beings see. We come to this world, you see a fantastic world. Sometimes people look at the world and they say, How did it come about? How is it we've got such a fantastic world? Where did it come from? So if you ask the question, what is it, and use a microscope and the telescope, uh, then you, you can't see God. Why not? It's like a fisherman who says, water does not exist, because when I put the net into the stream, it doesn't bring up any water, or it brings up fish. So the microscope and telescope can tell us about the macrocosm and the microcosm, but it doesn't tell us who. Who started all this? How did it all start? Me vara eile. Me and eile makes Elohim. In other words, once you recognize, as the progress of science, mankind recognizes more and more, the truth of this world is that it's constant creation. By a mind that's above creation. So that's nature. But the Aleph, that's the bait. The Aleph, the first time Hashem really revealed His will, to, to millions of people, was the Decalogue, Anochi. Anochi Hashem Elokech. And it starts with the big Aleph. The Aleph is really the beginning of divine revelation. Because Hashem, where did He reveal to Moshe Rabbeinu the Bereshit? When He went up to the mountain. There He, he told him the whole Torah. Torah Shibuktam, Torah Shibalpeh. And that came after the Yasera Tadibro. The Yasera Tadibro given to three million people. And it says, there's different versions, how far did the people really hear the words? They heard the sound of it. They witnessed the revelation. But that some, some explain. The first two sections, they're in the first, first and second person, and the others in the third person. So therefore they say, in the first and second person, Hashem addressed the people and they heard it. But when it came to the others, too difficult, they were given through Moshe Rabbeinu, and therefore used the third person. So, the beginning of everything is the Aleph. Now I want you to look at the Aleph. And this is according to the Arizal. It says some deep things. The Aleph, we know, is a letter that is not really pronounced. The only letter of the alphabet that has no real pronunciation. It's just really called a phonetically a stop sound. <coughs> you can pronounce a vowel under the alif. Yes, you know, almost alif o, you know, and say the alif a. So whatever vowel you put underneath, but as the, and we know the twenty-two letters of the alphabet. And if we can include the different form of the Tav Ashuri, it's called Tav Ashuri because there's deep significance, the way in which the Tevet Torah is written. Then you have the Tav Ashuri, you have also five different forms of consonants when there are a final letter. So totally there's 27. There's 27 letters of the Aleph. But the Aleph is in some extent a key to all of them. And if you look at the Aleph, the slant of the Aleph, as you find here, that's, that is really the consonant Vav. Instead of being straight up, Vav means a hook. It's on a slant. And you have a Yud on the right side at the top, and a Yud on the left side at the bottom. 
So numerically, this makes 26. Why? Because the Aleph is really something that contains all the letters. That means call the gematria, the numerical value of the Aleph, you've got 26. And why 26? Because 26 is all the numerical value of the ineffable name of Hashem. And it goes through as a code throughout the uh, Chumash. In fact, I'll tell you, it says, Sod Hashem, Lireyav, Ubritol, Hodyam. It says, Sod Hashem, Lireyav. Those who fear Hashem, they understand the Sod of Hashem. Sod is 70, the Shem is 26. 70 times 26 makes um, 1,000 and uh, 108. So it makes up the number of times that the Shem Avai is mentioned, the Chumash, is the equivalent to the multiple of 70 times 26. Now, this is the, we, call the, we call, call the whole Chumash Shem Hashem Ekra. It's all called the name of Hashem. It's all hinted at in this Aleph. And this Aleph is very significant. So you have, apart from the Aleph itself, you've got 26 letters in the Hebrew Aleph page, if you count the final letters. So this is a deeper concept, but I'm going to develop this, the real importance of Anochi Hashem Elokecha, because that's the beginning of the Aseret. I am Hashem, your God, who took you out from the land of Egypt. So what lies behind all this? So, for this, I could do no better than read you, this is a more recent translation, of the great master of Jewish thought, Rab Hirsch. And his commentary, which you have in English, is very deep and contains a lot of inspiration for us today. He said like this, that Anochi um, is to some extent a word which is just different than Ani. Ani is the personality of the speaker in opposition to the one addressed. It denotes the personality, the source of speech and action. That's ani from the root inner. Inner means what's happening. Anochi is further. It reveals the speaker, the personality, who is intimately close to the one addressed, who encompasses, bears, and supports the one addressed, and then whom alone the one addressed gets his security. How awesome is the majesty of this event in the midst of nature's upheaval, with foundations of the earth quaking. God proclaims himself as a so true and absolute personality, Anochi, of the universe, through whom alone all other beings exist, potentially and actually. So God turns to each individual and says, I am your Anochi, Anochi Hashem Elokecha. So some say this is not to be taken as a declaration but as a mitzvah. Well they ask, how can you have a mitzvah to tell a person to believe in God? Either he believes or he doesn't believe. As some say, the mitzvah only has significance if you believe in him. In fact, in connection with this, I had a debate once, it was held in the home of the President of Israel, and uh, there was a speaker there who spoke about uh, Reconstructionism. It's a, it's a branch of Reform Judaism in America, or Conservative Judaism. I mean, the founder of it was a teacher in a Jewish theological seminary, the seminary to produce conservative rabbis, and he believed in the importance of keeping mitzvot without believing in God. He said, he thought in his time, like uh, quite fashionable amongst Christian clergy and also amongst Jewish clergy, when it would appear to the popularizer of science, not the true scientists, that you can explain the world without God. So therefore, you know, they wrote books, you know, 
honest, vulnerable, honest to nature. Don't be honest to God, be honest to nature. And nature shows us that, like the, like we know the famous uh, first uh, space traveler from Russia, a communist, who said, I, I went out outer space, I couldn't find her anywhere. No image of God, nothing. So therefore, who says he exists? Well, <laughs> I mean, such a God has never been accepted in Judaism, a God who is an image. All the images that are given of God are anthropomorphic. God is pure spirit. It's the mind behind the universe. And today, scientists speak differently. But there was a time when I was a youngster when it was thought there's a contrast between science and religion and faith. And today, more or less disappeared. So, it, 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 so it says here, if it, so that, therefore there are many who say, like the Rambam, for example, Anushi Hashem Rakev the mitzvah. So what's the mitzvah? Because it lays the basis for an entire relationship to God, which is called Kabbalah, Ol Malchut Shaman, to accept the yoke of God's kingship. What the philosophers, ancient and modern, call the belief in the existence of God is as remote as can be from the meaning of this verse, regarding the foundations of Jewish thought and life. The fundamental truth of Jewish life is not belief in God's existence, nor the God is one and only one. It's the one and only God, the God of truth, is my God. So you can inform me. He gave me my standing, informed me of my duty, continued to create me. And that is my connection to him through the endless chain of events as a chance product of the universe, of which he was the first cause aching to long ago. Rather, my belief is that every breath that I take and every moment of my existence is a gift from his power and love, and that my duty is to devote every moment of my life to his service alone. In fact, the Midrash says, and uh, I mean, those of you who've, um, who have visited big museums, the middle of being a mashal, and that person made a portrait of someone, and it was so fantastic, from whichever angle you looked at this person's face, he was looking at you. And that's, you know, the famous painter, the Laughing Cavalier, the famous painter of Rembrandt, and if you see them, doesn't matter how far you go, the eyes are looking at you. So also, when Hashem gave, read the Moshe from the Midrash, when Hashem gave the Torah, it's all given the singular. He was addressing each human being. You should accept Kabbalah on Shaman. And this, this is really, it's a command of a basic people of Israel, Mamlechet Kohanim. But if you go more deeply into the Noahide Code, the Noahide Code, as it's been transmitted in our oral tradition, includes also belief in Hashem. And the Hasid Umut Ha'olam, some say it's a, the two versions in the Rambam. Some, some this, when, when can a person be called a wise man from the nation of the world? Or the Hasid of Umut Ha'olam, it's if he accepts the Noahide Code as coming from Moshe Rabbein, who heard it from Hashem. In other words, it's also based on what Hashem said to Noach, he said to one person. And then Noach passed it to his descendants, to his children, it was preserved by Hashem. But what he gave, and I said it, and he brought. And then that was given to three million of the people of Israel. And Hashem addressed himself to each person who was willing to hear, including also the non-Jewish world, who were willing to hear it. So this is the personal connection it's not the knowledge of God's existence, but the awareness and the acknowledgement that he's my God, that my faith is in his hands alone. He alone established the work of my hands. Now, what is the factual underlying basis of this? It here it does not refer so much, we see I said, to creation. In fact, one of these questions all the commentators ask, and also in the famous philosopher Kuzari, so the king of the Kuzaris, he asked this Jewish sage, says, 
Why did it say who took off and then it said who created you? No, because creation, who witnessed it? I mean, the only one who witnessed the last part of it was Adam himself. But otherwise, otherwise the, the, the truth of the creation chapter, because it was revealed by Hashem to Moshe Rabbeinu. So how do you, how, how do you as a nation, three millions of them, how, and that goes, not, we're not going now into all this, after our shot, we should know, people ask me questions non-stop, one-fifth, one, one, one out of five hundred, no matter, but it's clear that there are many midrashim, each one has significance, but there were three million people there. We counted 600,000 uh, men from the age of 20 upwards. So if you make a reckoning, there was children and there were women, not counting them. So the, totally, there were about three million. So those three million, we have that from them. It says in the Chumash itself that the, they were told and the next generation was told, you've got to preserve this. It's also in the Aserat Adibrod. It's historical fact. It's in me two aspects. Peita Vadim, Eretz Mitzrayim. The first aspect, God revealed himself as the champion of our faith. In the second, he, he acquired us as his servants. We should become the servants of Hashem. So the state in the land that held us in chain represents the epitome of statecraft and human power, harnessing the full range of natural resources. From there, God brought us out. He shattered the power of men, the force of nature, transforming, destroying them according to his will. And then we beat our them. We were slaves from birth. We've been fought deprived of freedom, and slavery is considered our natural state. Now, with some beta, we felt at home to some extent. We resigned ourselves to the situation that we were slaves to Paro. But Hashem took us out, and also it included here the fear that we were descending into the terrible corruption of idolatry, social and sexual evils which were so widespread in Egyptian society and we were part of it. So Hashem took us out from this and made us his servants. So, I am the as we say, we go from Avodah Paro and then Avodah Hashem, we sing, I am your servant from birth, for you loosened the bonds of my servitude. So we, that's the actual word we were reborn. And that explains also, as the Midrash says, if you, and you can analyze the Aseda Tadibrat to be parallel what we went into quite thoroughly, the Esa Makot. But now it's, no, there's not time for that. But it, since we did deal with the ten plagues at length, it doesn't say anywhere in the Chumash that there were ten plagues. But of course, if you analyze them, as we did, gave you a whole chart, there were definitely ten plagues. And each one had a different structure. We worked through the Tzach Adash Ba'achav, also the division of five and five. You see, clearly, there's a parallel. So really, this brings us to the concept, why are the, the plague, and why are the... the words of the text about why they're ten. What's the significance of ten? So maybe well, I would say I'll take I'd like to take any question on this tomorrow. And if you bring your chart that I've left with you, the ten plagues, and I'll show you from the Midrash how it makes a parallel between the ten plagues and the Ten Commandments. And it really got significant also how the Ten Commandments or the Ten we should call the ten words, how they bring true freedom to all mankind. And if they're neglected, unfortunately, we see this threat today. Human society can become lost in Tohovavo, in a complete chaos, chaotic state. And we look. Of course, there's the parallel, what he spoke about, the parallel, that 
the six days of creation contains ten words of Hashem to bring a special level in creation, which was then shown by the ten plagues, which says, you know that I am Hashem Elohim, I am the same God of creation, but at the same time I join to it the God of revelations, we could say, Hashem is the God of revelation in His kindness and His mercy, and Elohim are the laws that Hashem has given to the world. And that, that, that brings together creation, divine providence, and revelation as being a unit. So tomorrow, tomorrow I'd like to begin, begin this year by answering any questions yes, I have or comments. Thank you.